Good afternoon. I'd like to call the Wednesday, May 16th, 2018 Planning Commission hearing to order. Ms. Burke, if you call the roll. Here. 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 Our first order of business is to approve the minutes of our April 18th meeting. Are there any changes, modifications to the minutes or a motion to approve? I'll move to approve the minutes of the 41818 meeting as submitted. I'll second the motion. Burke? Aye. I abstain. Aye. 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 There are no items on our consent agenda, so our first order of business is public hearing PCR 18-010, request, request of Williamsburg James City County Schools for a special use permit to extend the temporary classroom trailer at Matthew Whaley School. Good afternoon. The Williamsburg James City County Public Schools is requesting a four-year extension of the special use permit authorized on March 13, 2014 by City Council to place a double-wide classroom trailer at Matthew Whaley School at 301 Scotland Street. They are requesting this extension through July of 2022. The application states that the current enrollment is at 480 students and their maximum capacity is 490 students. The applicant statement was included in your package. This classroom trailer was approved in March 2014 for a period lasting until July 31, 2018. The history of previous approvals was also included in your packages. This property is located in the downtown planning area of the 2013 Comprehensive Plan and is designated as public and semi-public, which includes government facilities, churches, public and private schools, fraternal organizations, nursing homes, and cemeteries. The Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area is located to the east with mixed-use and medium-density single-family to the west. The land to the north is designated as public and semi-public with land to the south designated as Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area and medium single-family res single residential. This property is zoned single-family dwelling district RS3. The property to the south is zoned RS3 in Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area. The land to the east is also zoned Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area. The land to the west is zoned Single Family Dwelling District RS3 in Downtown Limited Business. The land to the north is zoned Downtown Limited Downtown Business District B1 and the Museum Support District. Single Family Dwelling District RS3 with a special allows with a special use permit public or private elementary, middle and high schools, colleges and universities, including temporary classroom facilities when the access when accessory to and on the same lot as a school located in a permanent building. The Architectural Review Board reviewed this classroom trailer and its, and its design at its meeting on January 14, 2014 and, approved, and provided an approval. The Site Plan Review Committee decided not to meet to review this matter as it was their consensus that the use and the location as it continues to, it continues to be suitable for the site. The applicant proposes a four-year extension to the classroom, um, to a four-year extension to the special use permit authorized on March 13, 2014 by City Council to place the double-wide classroom trailer containing two classrooms at Matthew Willey School to remain through July of 2022. The applicant is not proposing any changes to the current layout or facilities. The school con is currently at 98% capacity, making the continued use of the classroom trailer necessary. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend to City Council that the special use permit be approved to allow the double-wide classroom trailer with two classrooms at Matthew Whaley School, 301 Scotland Street, to remain through July 2022. Staff is available if you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Aaron? Just a point of clarification, the 98% capacity um, is based on the school with the trailer, I assume? Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And just some of the language when I was reading through this, it talks about a trailer being placed. Are we actually swapping this for a new trailer, or is it the same? It's the, the same facility. Kind of just keep on staying there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. This extension is for four years. Correct. So this is a public hearing. If there are no other questions for Aaron, I'll open up the public hearing. 
open up the public hearing for PCR 18-010. Anyone would like to come speak? If anyone's from the school who wants to come speak? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Um, and it, I mean, I guess we've had uh, a couple of, for a long time, it seems like we've had a trailer there on and off, but now we're looking at having a trailer there relatively permanently, which I think is sort of a sad state of affairs, but I don't think there's much we can do about that. Um, the children have to have some place to be. Um, is there any discussion about this or? Uh, I move that we approve PCR 18-010 uh, um, to uh, leave the existing trailer um, at Matthew Whaley for another four years. Second. Ms. Burke. Aye. 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 Okay, our second uh, public hearing is PCR 18-011, which is a request of Holly Hills LLC to rezone approximately 6.8 acres at 200 Brookwood Drive. Chair Macbeth and members of Planning Commission, this is a request by Holly Hills LLC to rezone 6.8 acres at 200 Brookwood Drive from RM1 conditional with proffers to RM1 conditional with proffers. The current RM1 conditional with proffers limits the number of units allowed to 20 or less and requires the owner to pay $3,000 per lot towards the construction of the sidewalk from Jamestown Road to the carriage homes. In this request, the applicant is proposing to be relieved of the previous proffer that limits the number of residential units to 20 and proposes the density allowed in the RM1 zoning district, which is eight units per net developable acre. With 4.8 net developable acres, that would allow up to 38 units on this property if the rezoning request was approved. The applicant proffers a cash payment in the amount of $60,000 to the city within 30 days of the issuance of a land disturbance permit for the sidewalk that was constructed by the city from Jamestown Road to the carriage homes instead of $3,000 per lot as previously proffered. The 2013 comp plan designates this property as medium density multifamily residential land use and states duplexes, townhomes, and apartments with densities of up to eight dwelling units per net acre are recognized by this land use category. <clears throat> Design standards must be applied to ensure adequate off-street parking, open space, and compatibility with surroundings, especially existing residential neighborhoods. Apartments and other forms of multifamily dwellings may be allowed with a special use permit in certain areas within this residential category if they are properly designed. This category is implemented by the RM1 Zoning District. Chapter 8, page 7 of the comp plan recommends the existing medium density multifamily residential land use at eight dwelling units per net acre for this area and should be implemented by the RM1 Multifamily Zoning District. As stated previously, this property is zoned RM1 conditional and the statement of intent for the RM1 says this district is established as a residential area with medium population density. Population density and height of buildings are low enough to be generally compatible with single family residential developments in the same general area. This parcel was zoned Residence A, single family, when the property was annexed into the city in 1984. Following the adoption of the 89 comp plan, the zoning was changed to RM1 multifamily dwelling district with eight dwelling units per net acre in 1991. In 97, in conjunction with an amendment to the 89 comp plan, the zoning was changed at the request of McHale Development Corporation to LBR, Limited Business Residential District. The LBR district allowed single family and duplex dwellings by right and multifamily and townhouse dwellings with a special use permit. As part of the implementation of the 98 comp plan, this area was rezoned to the new LB4 district, which did not allow residential units. In 2004, a site plan was approved for four office buildings totaling 40,000 square feet of office space with 200 parking spaces. 
The 2006 comp plan designates this property as office land use, and a site plan was approved in 2006 for seven office buildings totaling 22,652 square feet of office space and 200 parking spaces. In 2007, McHale Development Corporation requested a rezoning from LB4 to RM1 to permit development of a duplex townhome project comparable to the adjacent carriage homes. Staff re recommended denial of the request because it did not comply with the 2006 comp plan. After discussions at Planning Commission and then at City Council, the property was rezoned in 2008 with proffers that limit the number of dwelling units to not more than 20 and the cash contribution of $3,000 per unit for the sidewalk construction from Jamestown Road to the carriage homes. The 2013 comp plan designates this property as medium density multifamily residential land use with a maximum density of up to eight dwelling units per net acre and is implemented by the RM1 Multifamily Dwelling Zoning District. In the RM1 Zoning District, single family, duplex dwellings, and townhomes are allowed by right. Multifamily dwellings, including apartments, require a special use permit in the RM1 District. This property, as I mentioned, is currently zoned RM1 conditional, which limits the number of dwelling units to 20 and requires the $3,000 per dwelling unit, totaling $60,000 towards the sidewalk improvements made along Route 199 as proffered by the applicant in 2007. This application is for a rezoning of the property to RM1 conditional with a proffer that the applicant will make a cash payment in the amount of $60,000 to the city with, within 30 days of the issuance of a land disturbance permit for reimbursement to the city for the sidewalk previously constructed by the city from Jamestown Road to the carriage homes and request the remove, removal of the 20 unit maximum as previously proffered. This is not an application for the development of the townhome complex. The city engineer has reviewed the project and notes that previous plans contained more traffic volume than the 38 units proposed and concludes that Brookwood Drive and the traffic light at 199 can handle the 38 residential units on this property. The existing stormwater management facility was, de was designed to handle runoff from the carriage homes property, this property and the property across right 199 that drains into the pond. Utilities are also available to the site. The images submitted indicating a townhouse layout has not been proffered and has not been reviewed by staff. If the rezoning to RM1 conditional is approved, the applicant would need to meet ordinance requirements for development of the property, which requires planning commission approval. Before a site plan or subdivision can be approved, the Architectural Review Board must approve the buildings, structures, and exterior architectural features since this property is located in a corridor protection district. This property is not located in an archaeological protection district. Therefore, staff recommends that Planning Commission recommend the City Council that the request to rezone 200 Brookwood Drive from RM1 Multifamily Dwelling District conditional to RM1 conditional multifamily dwelling district be approved because the request meets the density allowed in the RM1 multifamily dwelling district as outlined in the comp plan. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> the applicant and the applicant's attorney, Dan Quarles, are also present if you have any questions of them. Any questions of Carolyn? I have one um, <clears throat> regarding the stormwater handling of the pond. Um, just for the record, this pond was built to handle both Holly Hills carriage homes, any development that would be on the property we're talking about, and handles uh, runoff from 199. Is that correct? That's correct. The pond was designed for the carriage home property, this vacant property, and the drainage area that's across 199 in the county. And should a, uh, another development be allowed? and pass all the uh, ARB and Planning Commission, uh, the responsibility of the pond would go to those the owners of those. Mr. Quarles can probably answer that, but it's my understanding that there's, they have rights to use the pond, and once they 
develop on the property. There needs to be some agreement between the existing property owners and the carriage home and the new property that's being developed. But Mr. Quarles may be able to answer that better than me. Okay, so before we get to that, are there other questions of Carolyn? I, I do have a question. Um, in a previous life, I was sitting on the Planning Commission during this 2007-2008 um, rezoning from LB4 to RM1, and that was a fairly involved um, set of meetings and conversations, and what we came down to, the resolution of the 20 units at that time was through, um, you know, through considerable discussion. So the question is, has the RM1 density changed since 2007-2008? No. This is, they just proffered the 20 units in, right. in their previous request. So the, the, the discussion at that time that got us to 20, at that time it was still eight per That's net right. acre, right? That's but that was not what was resolved proper. at that time. So there isn't new um, guidance or from the most recent comprehensive plan that this should be higher density than it was before when it was you know, adjudicated that it should be at the 20. Right. Once it went from RM1 conditional, when the comp plan was updated, we went to the RM1 uh, category for the comp plan so the two would match. So when you say adjudicated, I'm just so wondering, it, it, was it a, a negotiated it, it, agreement? Yes, then? and so it was? could, if, if I wanted to make sure I was understanding this, that it had already gone through the process that while they could have had, I guess, 38, 20 was deemed what was the appropriate number at that time. And so in part, for me, the discussion that I'd like to have some information is what has changed that we as representatives of the city should go away from what had been a very detailed discussion of the 20 to 38 when the rules at the table are all the same. And I think the applicant will be able Understood. to Understood. I just, I just wanted to that, make sure that yeah. I, was, I was aware that we were all aware that, in fact, that has not changed in the past 10 years. And let me clarify one thing. At that time, the applicant proffered the 20 units on the property. So that was what Planning Commission and Council considered. Right. OK, any, any other comments at this point? Okay, so I would like to um, open the public hearing and first give the floor to the applicant or his representative. This one, Dan, would be great. Thanks. Good afternoon, members of Planning Commission. I'm Dan Quarles. I'm a lawyer. I represent Holly Hills LLC. Here with me tonight is a representative of Holly Hills LLC is John Kale. John Kale's father is Hatcher Kale. Hatcher Kale is a developer with a long track record of delivering quality, um, high quality and successful development product projects throughout Hampton Roads, on the peninsula and farther afield. Uh, his work here in the city of Williamsburg that you would be familiar with includes both Holly Hills single family homes and Holly Hills carriage homes. And those are projects which I think everyone in this room would agree are assets to the city of Williamsburg. Uh, Mr. Kale and Holly Hills would like to move forward uh, with another high-quality development project and deliver another asset to the city of Williamsburg, this time in the form of a high-quality townhouse project at this parcel in question. And that has led to their rezoning request this afternoon. The request is, is very simple. I think it's a reasonable request, and it's one that really ought to be not controversial. The property in question, the, the specific parcel, and the properties that surround it are all designated RM1 by the 2013 Comprehensive Plan. The RM1 zoning designation allows townhouse developments by right, and it also contemplates eight units per developable acre. So uh, in the ordinary course, this parcel would be permitted by right to have 38 townhouse units. But the situation is there's this special condition on this property that limits the developer to the 20 units. And our request is simply to be relieved of that 20 unit limitation so that the property can be developed to the density allowed by the RM1 designation. The effect of that is going to be twofold. Number one, it's going to conform the zoning for this property on the ground to the 2013 comp plan, which is good. It's also going to enable the developer through, uh, to achieve certain economies of scale when he develops the project, the end result of which is going to be a nicer, better townhouse project, which is good for everyone. 
The existing 20 unit limitation is really kind of a historical accident that results from the complicated zoning history that uh, Ms. Murphy was discussing. Back in the 1989 comprehensive plan, this parcel was zoned RM1 without any limitation. The 38 units of townhomes, townhomes was, uh, would have been permitted by right. Back in 1997, the developers of Holly Hills Carriage Homes were contemplating an office park on this parcel. So in 1997, the developer requested a change in the zoning away from RM1 to a designation that allowed non-residential use, and that was granted. What happened was, uh, in 1998, a new comp plan came out. As you know, and are getting ready to be involved in, comp plan gets updated from time to time. And in 1998, when the comprehensive plan was done, what they did was the plan followed the zoning on the ground. And so the 1998 comprehensive plan recited that this parcel was intended for non-residential office use. And in the early 2000s, several office park site plans for this location were approved. By the mid-2000s, however, the Holly Hills Carriage Home neighborhood was getting built out, and the Holly Hills Carriage Homes were selling really well, and Holly Hills Carriage Homes had uh, proved to be a very successful development project. And it occurred to the developer, aha, the success of this project here leads me to conclude that this parcel is much better suited for residential use than an office park. So in 2007, they sought to rezone the parcel back to RM1, just as it had been 10 years earlier before they went down the fruitless trail of, of pursuing an office park, one that they eventually concluded was not the highest and best use. The problem, however, when they went before uh, the city commission in 2007, was that asking to go back to RM1 was now contrary to the comp plan, because the comp plan had followed the prior rezoning. So when they went seeking uh, that designation or change in 2007, staff recommended against it as contrary to the comp plan. So the developer proffered this cap of 20 units as a concession to secure a rezoning that then was, co was contrary to the then existing comp plan. And to speak to Ms. McBeth's question earlier, the thing that has changed is not the RM1 density, the thing that has changed is the comp plan. Because the comp plan has changed since then. The comp plan now contemplates this as RM1. Um, so back in 2007, um, the developer proffered this cap. And back in 2007, the 20-unit cap was not, a pro was not a problem for the developer. The uh, carriage homes were selling great. And I believe that, uh, you know, I know that at that time the intent was to put 10 more carriage homes, 10 duplexes for the 20 units. And I believe that that's all the site would really accommodate at, at the carriage home size and uh, site. The world has changed since 2007. This little thing came along called the Great Recession. And the Holly Hills carriage home prices have substantially decreased, while at the same time cost of construction has substantially increased. And the economic reality today is that there's not going to be any more carriage homes on that site. It's an economic impossibility from the standpoint of the developer. It cannot be, he cannot develop that site as carriage homes and make money, and it's not going to happen. So that brings us to uh, the current time, where we're now tasked with saying, well, what are we going to do since we're not proceeding with the carriage home plan? Um, Holly Hills is ready to develop this parcel as high-quality townhomes. There is a strong and demonstrated demand for that product in the local community. The 2013 comp plan identifies this area as RM1, allows the townhomes by right. But because of this historical accident and the tortured zoning history that this property has, it's currently capped at this 20 townhouse limitation instead of 38. So understand that the developer can go move forward and develop 20 townhouses there by right without, any, without say so from anyone. They already have the ability to do that. But when he, the developer proceeds with uh, in putting in a townhouse project, there's certain sunk costs that are involved in that project. Installing the road, installing utility hookups, the infrastructure that goes into the project. And those sunk costs don't change as you go from 20 to 38 parcels. So and when you increase the number of parcels, you increase the developer's margin, the, the revenue that can come in. And that enables the developer to invest more money in the uh, appointments of the townhouses, in their finishes, in their exterior appearance. 
there's more margin to deliver a better product because the sunk cost of the project gets spread out over more units. So you can improve the project. And this is an unusual situation in that because the property is owned RM1, the developer can achieve those economies of scale and not violate the, you know, not violate the, the zoning because uh, it's already d designated under the comprehensive plan as RM1. So the economies of scale can be achieved not only not by, not only not violating the comprehensive plan, by actually carrying it out and giving it effect, since the comp plan says that this area is RM1. <coughs> RM1. And it is Holly Hill's goal to deliver a high quality product that's going to be an asset to the city. Uh, John Cale and his family, his brother and his family live right next door in Holly Hills. They're not uh, some people storming in from out of town who are unconcerned about putting some blight on the community. They live here, they live right next door, and they want to deliver a high quality project. And this rezoning, removing this cap that was not a problem when the developer proposed it uh, back in 2007, but which has become an obstacle because of economic realities and changes since 2007, um, is an impediment to proceeding with a quality development. And this modest 18 unit increase that we're talking about, because the 20 are, are by right already. So we're only talking about going from 20 to 38, 18 additional townhouse units. It's not going to tax any city resources. It's not going to tax the city infrastructure. So uh, in the final analysis, it's a reasonable proposal uh, and one that I would submit should not be controversial. However, it has, I think, as you noted, generated controversy. And there have been a number of citizen comments, some of which I'll address. A number of emails raise issues about traffic concerns. Um, I would direct your attention to page five of Ms. Murphy and the city staff's uh, detailed memorandum which recites that the city engineer has reviewed the project and concludes Brookwood Drive and the traffic light at Route 199 can handle 38 residential units on the property. The city's, uh, excuse me, uh, the developer's engineers at Van Ness, Hang, and Bruslin uh, concluded that the intersection, in fact, could handle as many as 67 townhouse units without even reaching a level of traffic volume that would trigger a, uh, a need or a, a, a reason to have a traffic study. So the traffic issue is a non-issue from the standpoint of the engineers and, and city staff. Moreover, as a practical matter, none of the traffic that we're talking about is going to pass by any of the Holly Hills carriage homes on Brookwood. I've been to the site myself three different times. And if you look at the site program that was attached to our application, you'll see the road and the proposed development superimposed on the city GIS site. I've been out there myself to make sure that there's not some mistake that I'm unaware of. But as you turn onto Brookwood and then turn into this development, you do not pass a Holly Hills carriage home. I can understand concerns about traffic if the entrance to this uh, neighborhood was going to be at the far end of Holly Hills carriage homes, but it is not. They're simply going to share a traffic light as they turn onto 199. A number of appearance concerns have been raised. This parcel is in the corridor protection district. Those of you have, who have served on ARB or uh, currently co-serve on it, and at least one of you does now, uh, know that there are stringent requirements that govern construction that occurs in the corridor protection district. The appearance of the townhouses must be submitted to and approved by the Architectural Review Board. The Corridor Protection District guidelines require the townhomes to complement and contribute to the existing scale and character of the corridor. So they will, because they have to, and the ARB is there to ensure that, and that's something that will be before the ARB on a future date. So it's, it's a non-issue. The appearance of the townhomes must conform with the city's guidelines. The ARB will be the arbitrator of that whether there are 20 units or whether there are 38 units. That's up to uh, the appearance of them. It's governed by the ARB. The issue before you, the issue for Planning Commission, is density. As a practical matter, whether there are 20 townhomes or 38, they're not going to be visible from the majority of the Holly Hills carriage homes. If you look at the map, the majority of the Holly Hills carriage homes have no line of sight to this development project. 
because their view is eclipsed by other Holly Hills carriage homes. The handful of Holly Hills carriage homes that have a line of sight, it's going to be across a pond and obscured by trees to the area where the townhouses are. Property value concerns have also been uh, raised in the emails. First of all, I don't accept the idea that a neighborhood of duplexes is going to be adversely affected by having a neighborhood of townhouses next door. Just by way of example, I live in Kings Mill. Uh, and in Kings Mill, you have streets of single family homes. And right on adjacent street, you have uh, streets that are townhouses. And those townhouse developments throughout Kings Mill and the single family homes and the townhouse and duplex developments have lived together and that community has thrived for many years. People who live in townhouses aren't bad people. They're no better or worse than people who live in duplexes or single family homes. And as a practical matter, there is going to be a townhouse neighborhood next door. It's just a question of whether it's going to be 20 units or 38 units. And there's no reason to suppose that somehow going from 20 to 38 is going to negatively or adversely impact the Holly Hills carriage home owners' property values. And in fact, uh, for these reasons of economies of scale that I've talked about, going from 20 to 38 is going to result in better townhouses next door to them, which would actually benefit them from a property value standpoint. So in conclusion, um, Holly Hills is simply requesting a rezoning to remove this 20-unit limit make the parcel density consistent with its historical zoning dating back as far as 1989 and to conform it to its current zoning under the 2013 comp plan so that Holly Hills can deliver another uh, high quality project for the city of Williamsburg. I'll be here, Mr. Kale will be here uh, at the appropriate time when you're deliberating. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to field those. I don't know if you have any uh, for me right now. So yeah, Dan, if you, if you don't mind, um, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Quarles? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, I have speaker cards as we open up the public hearing to um, the general population here. Um, and um, Ms. Burke is going to be maintaining a five minute counter on speaker cards, so I won't be aware of that as we start off. The first card I have is from Gordon White at 213 Brookwood Drive. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm Gordon White at 213 Brookwood Drive. Um, frankly, the attorney for the applicant seem, seems to me to be playing a shell game with the, the past zoning and planning. The zoning now doesn't permit the 38, uh, which is almost twice what is, is permitted and what the people in Holly Hills Carriage Homes have had uh, and expected to have. Uh, we're disappointed that we've seen no uh, elevation uh, of the proposed buildings. We've got a plan, but we don't know what they're going to look like. It, uh, we, we would feel much better if, if they were as beautiful as the <coughs> attorney suggests they would be. Um, I'm very puzzled about the use of the <coughs> settling pond. I would have thought that the applicant would have made an arrangement with the existing HOA that has been um, maintaining at some cost that pond uh, before making an application in which he would use it. Uh, I, I think that really covers what I have to say, and there are many other people who are uh, going to speak after me. Great, thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, the next speaker I have is Susan Langston at 184 Exmoor Court. Hello, I am Susan Langston. My husband and I live at 184 Exmoor Court in the Holly Hills Carriage Homes, and we've been residents there for 12 years. I am currently serving as treasurer of the Board of Directors. Back in 2008, we stood with Mr. Kale. We supported him in his effort to get the zoning which he now holds. We have had the promise of the development of that area for 10 years, and we want that development to take place. I'm not here to object 
just to be objecting to the building. I'm objecting to the change. As I said, we have waited 10 long years, and during that time, Mr. Kale's property has been a real eyesore as all of us have entered our community. Just because the number 38 is permitted does not mean that that is the best that you can do for us and that he can do for us. These proffers and promises that we received in 2008 is like being on a train, waiting 10 years, and all of a sudden the train jumped the tracks. And we have been put on a track to go to destination B, C, and D, and we don't want to go there. All for the same reason. The three proposals that we have seen include too much density to match and complement our area. None of the proposals have shown garages. We're looking at large, large pieces of uh, pavement, accommodating perhaps up to 100 parking spaces. When there are no garages, where are owners going to put their ladders, their bicycles, their grills? Any neighborhood without garages is going to look pretty shabby pretty soon. So for, the reason, for those reasons, we don't want to go to those destinations. None of the three proposals uh, appeal to us at all. Uh, as, as being complementary to our neighborhood. So let's go back to that first destination. And Mr. Quarles said that it is impossible to financially build the promised 20 townhomes. We have wanted to meet with Mr. Kale. We have asked him and he has not met with us to answer our question, and thus there has been a lot of contention uh, over this issue. While Mr. Kale has not told our community plainly why he will not develop the 20 townhomes, we assume that it is about the money, as Mr. Quarles said. But let me offer a couple of positive proposals for using, for building 20 uh, townhomes. 20 could be built very similarly to our townhomes, but with less square footage. We are rather small in appearance from the front, but our townhouses, townhomes have great depth to them. That square footage could be reduced from 2,700, as in our case, square feet, to 2,000. Three bedrooms to two, three and a half baths to two and a half. My other suggestion would be to consider a concept such as duplexes that are, town, that are patio homes in nature, one level something that I think is very needed in this community, but designed by an architect that with uh, good uh, quality and, uh, excuse me, my time is up. Thank you very much, but I would like for Mr. Kale to consider other agreeable arrangements. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, our next speaker card is at Yule, at 224 Brookwood Drive. Uh, Pat Yule here. Uh, Miss, Mr. Quarles mentions some facts, right, many facts uh, in his comments. 
And I don't know, understand this process completely, but our community, so many of the individuals have written letters to the Planning Commission, which answered many of those concerns. But uh, right now, and, and the, to me, the bottom line is 20 units has been, has been doubled to 38 units. And uh, as I understand it, the Planning Mission Commission has recommended to the City Council that Cal's third rezoning quest be approved. That's my understanding. Uh, HHCH has failed in its attempt to communicate otherwise to the Planning Commission. HHCH residents have already forwarded to the Planning Commission our request and documented reasons why we think Cal's third rezoning request should be denied. Therefore, in my opinion, the bottom line is for you who are in power to vote your conscience and do the right thing as you see it. You have the letters and you have the facts. Thank you so much. Thank you. The um, next speaker card is Pamela Laguerre. I'm Pamela Legier. My husband and I ride at one seven, reside at 173 Exmoor Court. We've lived there for 15 years. Once again, you received many letters from residents of the Holly Hills Carriage Homes and a new petition in opposition of Mr. Kale's resounding request. I, along with my neighbors, oppose his request for the following reasons. We have no idea what the townhomes will look like, what materials will be used, and the elevation of the townhomes. The drawing that Mr. Cal submitted doesn't show garages. Where will the garbage and recycle cans be stored and other outside items? Or will they have large dumpsters? Not a pretty picture for our residents to have to look at and it cheapens the area. We're still concerned about the number of units. Although it is within the comp plan requirements, 38 is still too many. His plan shows 86 parking spaces for the 38 units. This is a lot of cars entering and exiting our neighborhood, which brings up a safety concern. I attached to my letter emails from both the Williamsburg and James City County Police Departments showing the number of accidents at the Brookwood and 199 intersection. Since 2015 and up to February the 5th of this year, police have worked 101 accidents. Another two have happened since that date. That's a lot of accidents, and that number just keeps increasing each year. Just think what that number could look like adding so many more vehicles coming and going at that intersection. Our property values are also a big concern. Having homes of a lesser value will bring down our property values. With all the new luxury townhomes being built in the city, for example, 184 being built in Quarter Path at Williamsburg, which has two car attached garages and will have a clubhouse, pool, and fitness center, along with the buildings in James City County, just minutes from the carriage home at the promenade in Williamsburg Crossing and in Newtown, all with attached garages. Do we really need more townhomes? When Holly Hills townhomes don't sell, what will be the limit on the rentals in the townhomes? To me, it seems like we'll be right back to Mr. Kell's original rezoning request for rental apartments only with a lesser amount. Our neighborhood is also concerned with the retention pond, which is our biggest HOA expense. The end closest to his entrance where he built a retaining wall is starting to fill with silt from runoff from his property. Will he be required to assist in the maintenance of the pond? A proffer was offered and accepted by the Planning Commission in 2007 for the rezoning from LBR to RM-1 for no more than 20 dwelling units in the amount of $3,000 per dwelling for $60,000. Now Mr. Kell is offering a proffer of only $60,000 for the 38 townhomes. Although against his rezoning request, why wouldn't that amount be $114,000 and not $60,000? Williamsburg is experiencing an expanding retirement population. I believe what is needed in the city is small, one-story luxury homes with garages, such as in Windsor Mead and Williamsburg Landing. This time I'd ask the, uh, anyone that's here opposed to this rezoning request to stand. Thank you. 
thank you for listening to my concerns, and I ask that you please deny this rezoning request. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Harvey Margulies. Good afternoon, Chairman Macbeth, members of the Planning Commission. I haven't spoken to a panel like this since 1958 when I talked to General William Westmoreland. Uh, I'm going to read this because my wife says that I kind of tend to get off the track. I am Harvey Margulies. I've lived in Williamsburg in the Holly Hills carriage homes for the last 16 years. Before that, I resided in Hampton for 30 years and visited and shopped in, and shopped in Williamsburg regularly. And the reason that I lived in Hampton was that I was on a 15-minute alert for our tankers to take off and get out over the Atlantic before the fighters launched. You can't get from Williamsburg to Hampton in 15 minutes, not in 1961 and 62. Um, I worked for 13 years as a boat captain on the Rhine River. Before that, my second career was uh, as a vice president at Bank of America. I tell you this background so you can understand how much I love the city of Williamsburg and how fortunate I feel to live here. Today we're talking of changing the character of our city from welcoming suburban, tasteful community to that of a crowded, cramped urban development that encroaches on the natural environment. And by the way, I am not a lawyer with the uh, Holly Hills LLC. Um, I don't know if any of you, who I assume you do not live in Kings Mill, but you might, uh, if you do, you are not in the city of Williamsburg. My, tra my concerns are traffic. You just heard from Pam. She's absolutely right. Unless you live in the Holly Hills Carriage Home community, you don't know what that traffic is. Granted, that driveway that uh, he's been talking about doesn't come all the way into our property but it sure is a mess trying to get out. Okay, the uh, fragile stormwater facility, you asked a question, I think uh, Mr. Edwards, um, we own the stormwater management facility. For those of you that don't know what that is, that's a pond, okay? And uh, that was given to us without our wanting it by the Holly Hills LLC rezoning. And if you don't think that that's an expense, and originally uh, Mr. Kale was going to split that expense with us, but we haven't seen a dime yet on the maintenance of that. We've had to put in a second pump, and I was the president of the unit of the uh, community at that point. Very expensive. Plus, it had to be um, uh, deep. I don't know whether you'd call it deepened. But after you changed the zoning the last time, the first thing that happened was half the trees out there were taken down and the silt was dumped into the pond. We had to pay to clean up the pond. In two letters which I sent to the Planning Commission, the builder has not addressed any of these concerns with an actual plan and therefore his request should be denied. The original builder, along with his architect, an attorney met with us and presented a plan to build a professional park with four one-story um, buildings which would have been a medical uh, area, doctors and pharmacy, etc. Um, his son proceeded to get the property rezoned and immediately removed most of the trees on the property. This caused uh, soil to erode into the stormwater management facility uh, which the company had earlier deeded to our HOA against our acceptance. It became a very difficult problem to manage and required a great deal of attention and financial issues. I not only do not like the 38 units that they propose, I don't even like the 20. I would rather go back to the four or five one-story buildings for a medical profession. Do you have any questions of me? Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Ken Gross. Thank you. you going here? Yep. Uh, Mrs. Murphy, commissioners, uh, thank you very much for uh, having uh, 
allowing us to express our opinions and concerns about this. I am Ken Gross. I live at 148 Exmoor Court, have been there for 13 years, original homeowners. I look at there being two possible outcomes here. The, uh, the first of those outcomes is to uh, de develop those 6.0 acres with the current uh, comprehensive plan approval and the current zoning approval. And that uh, gives us 62, it adds to the existing 62 uh, carriage homes. And in doing that, we could uh, join into the, the new properties into our community. Uh, same covenants, bylaws, rules, regulations, same quarterly dues, uh, same budget, same voting rights, same board of directors, same meetings, so on and so forth. Even this, the uh, reserve capital fund that we have could be uh, expanded to cover the new neighborhood. Uh, use the same contractors for property management, landscaping, irrigation, uh, pond management, so on and so forth. So that's really integrating the new homes into the existing community. And by the way, the reason that the pond management is such a hot issue is that just this week we spent $8,700 to have it dredged and have it uh, maintained. So that's, um, oh, and the, that, that would use the same uh, paving and the, uh, that's already been put in there to build the 20 additional uh, units. So that's, uh, that's the first outcome. Basically, it's what the city comprehensive plan talks about and what we uh, expected when we purchased in the Holly Hills Carriage Home. The uh, second outcome would be what's being talked about and proposed in this uh, hearing. That's basically a parking lot surrounded by uh, 38 townhouses, townhouses without garages, and it's just within the RM3, RM1 uh, zoning of eight uh, dwelling units per acre. It's actually 7.9 is what's been proposed. Uh, compare that to Holly Hills Carriage Home that exists today, and that is 5.3 units per acre. So there's a big difference there between what's being proposed and what it currently exists. I uh, don't know about the elevation, but that's really a matter for the Architectural Review Board. Uh, but it's certainly going to be different, a different architecture than what we have today, and it's not at all within the scale and character of the existing neighborhoods. I say that because it comes straight out of the 2003 comprehensive plan in the preamble to the document. Scale and character of the existing neighborhoods. So it's not uh, at all going to be integrated in with the Cawley Hills Carriage Home uh, by design. It's going to have very different and separate associations, covenants, bylaws, uh, budgets, dues, so on and so forth. So the, uh, the second outcome is really not just mixing apples and oranges into the same orchard. It's more like mixing apples and orangutans into the same orchard. It's very different. And so we ask, why are we trying to do this? Um, why are we trying to shove townhouses into and next to carriage homes? I say that it comes right down to the profits of this. Uh, you know, we can talk all we want about economies of scale, about uh, demographic shifts, housing trends, time on the market for differential types of housing, so on and so forth. But it's really the profits. And you've got to ask the profits for whom. Is it for the community that's been building up Holly Hills carriage homes over the last 20 years, or is it for the developer? So um, if you do release the orangutans into the apple grove here, uh, you're never going to be able to put them back into the cage. And the orangutans do eat apples. So uh, thank you very much. If any questions, I'll be happy to. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My next speaker card is um, Doug Stiegler.
Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, members of the board for, for hearing our community's comments on this um, proposed change to the makeup of our community and our neighborhood. You've heard how this proposal will infect the people that live there. Uh, my wife and I live on Brookwood. Uh, we've only been there three and a half years compared to some of these people who have been here for 10, 12, 15 years. Uh, they've gone through a lot of the pond management that you heard about. They've gone through the requested zoning changes, made approvals of that, agreed to what was going on there. Um, I, two, just two comments about the um, properties itself. One, we hear a lot of talk about this uh, sidewalk reimbursement. And if you can look at the picture, the sidewalk goes from the last corner up by the uh, water tower up to Jamestown Road. To come out of that property that's being rezoned, to get to that sidewalk, people are going to have to come up, walk all the way up Brookwood, come up through the community on Exmoor, through the woods, and then up by the tower onto the road. I foresee that they're not going to do that. They're going to walk right across the street, go out the 199, walk up the gutter, or in the site on the grass. You heard about 115 accidents in the last several years. They're with the vehicles. We have 100 people walking up that sidewalk to get up the Jamestown Road. You're not going to have accidents with vehicles. You're going to have accidents with people. I think this proposal goes through. There should be some consideration for a sidewalk from the developer, from their development, up the side <coughs> to the connecting uh, sidewalk of a Jamestown Road. Um, the gentleman presenting, I missed, missed his name, the lawyer uh, presenting the proposal, mentioned it's, it's just a change of a number of units. It's not just a change of a number of units. It's a change of a concept. We're not talking about duplex houses as we have here in the size that we have. Again, we're talking about a row of townhouses with no garages. You heard that comment, and I think you can visualize what no garages means. We've had some problems recently in our community uh, with people who are leaving their trash cans out two and three and four days in a row. Um, with no garage, they're going to have to put those in their house, take them behind a townhouse. How do you get behind a townhouse where there are six or eight of them in a row to put your trash can out of the way? Trash cans are going to be sitting out. That means extra trash on the street, um, putting them out early or leaving them there overnight. So there, there are things to consider here that have not been considered. You've heard these, you've heard the comments from our community. Um, the economic realities of building units, more units of different character than what we have now is going to cause us to have uh, more problems than, than we need in our community. So I just would appreciate um, consideration of the comments you've heard today and have uh, a good report that would be favorable to our community, um, not just to the development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Um, our next speaker is Noel Veden. Good afternoon. My name is Noel Vedin and I live at 212 Brookwood Drive. I would simply like to, I have a, I have a speech that I could make to you, but I think that uh, in the interest of time, I'll simply echo the, my feelings that uh, have been expressed by my neighbors, my, my friends, that we would like to see, I personally would like to see the land developed. I live at 212. I look across the pond towards the development. I would like to see it done in a tasteful way. I would like to see 20 uh, more neighbors over there, not 38. I would like to see them have garages. And I would like to see them share in my responsibility to maintain that stormwater retention pond. Um, I would also like to comment the fact that uh, Mr. Quarles must have gone to a different piece of property because when he says the driveway does not access any of the units in our, in our complex, when you come out of the driveway from this part of our neighborhood, you drive right into the front door of 201 and 205 and right down the side of 212 or 2, 2, uh, 208. So it does affect at least three units, uh, the traffic does, in that situation. At any rate, I echo what my neighbors have said. We hope that you'll uh, hold him to his promise that he made in 208 to build 20 more of our kinds of units. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
So that exhausts the speaker's cards that I have for this um, public hearing. If anyone else would like to come forward and speak on this, please come to the podium and state your name. My name is Susie Kelsey, and I live at 128 Brockton Court. And I'd like to clear up a few errors that happened on the, on the lawyer's part. First of all, I face the pond, and I will see every single house. There's not enough trees. I moved from King's Mill, which is heavy in forestation, to Holly Hills. So I will see every single home. And back in February, we were going to have 50 apartment buildings, 50 units. And it looked like a federal prison, in my opinion. So when he talks about quality homes, well, it wasn't quality in February. What are we going to get now? Because there are no plans. So I will be deeply affected. And also, when I moved in, I was told that there would be 20 town homes or carriage homes built like mine, which is why I invested in Holly Hills. If I had known what was proposed now, I would never have bought in Holly Hills, ever. So please save my investment and everybody else's investments, because we are an over 50 community, and the next phase we go into will be senior living, and we need our investments protected. And we need to make money, I know you need to make money, but we all have to be fair in this. And we will be decimated, our, my opinion is, our property values will be decimated. And the only one that will profit will be Mr. Kale. Thank you. Anyone else like to come forward and speak? <clears throat> My name is Lawrence Langston. I'm with Susan 184 Exmoor Court. In listening to the comments, I hope you can appreciate the fact that we are really sincere about this. This is something, and we moved in in 2006, during the time that this property was zoned for the commercial property. I remember attending a meeting with both Mr. Kale and his father, saying, if you will support us in rezoning the commercial property to the 20 townhomes to be constructed, replicating the current homes, carriage homes, we will promise you to do that, and we'll also promise you to pay $60,000 to the city for constructing a sidewalk. Now that, folks, was approved. Where did the $60,000 profit ever come into play? He's never paid it. And now he's offering a $60,000 again. If we do. And, and meanwhile, he should have reimbursed the city at that time. Now we've also asked Mr. Kale, through our association manager, to sit down with our community and discuss this process. We have some, you've heard some alternatives today. He has refused to do that. Hide behind his attorney's suit for whatever reason. We're neighbors, folks, just like you all. You have neighbors. If you want to do something different to your home, what would you do? Wouldn't you reach out to your neighbor and say, I'm wanting to build a porch on our back deck? And wouldn't you want to have him be involved in that process? No, Mr. Kale refuses to meet with us. Now, can you imagine that? Refuses to meet with us. So I say to Mr. Kale, we have got a real credibility problem. And as far as that pond is concerned, we have been after him repeatedly to, to contribute, not only Mr. John Kale Jr., but his father, Hatcher Kale. Now, folks, i got to plead with your and also with a comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan says you will protect and preserve the integrity of neighborhoods. This project is nebulous. It has no specifics. And again, back to the garages. No garages, trash containers. This, and then we don't know what, if he can't sell them, the rental issue. We have a cap on our rental issue. There are so many unanswered questions. I would plead with you to say to Mr. Kale, you need to go back and redesign this whole process. You need to work with your neighbors, your future neighbors, to address these issues. So I just plead with you all to really consider 
you live in our community. How would you feel? How would you feel? Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Anyone else like to come forward and speak? Okay. I'm seeing no one who wants to come forward. Oh, no. Nope. Someone's just popped up. State your name, please. Uh, my name's Brian Twitty. Um, I'm a resident in the city, and I cannot speak to a myriad of the concerns that the residents in Holly Hills Carriage Home have involving the stormwater and any of the other concerns you've had with the development over the years. But as a uh, resident of the city, um, I first saw the initial proposal involving the condominiums that he was looking as a rental possibility. I thought that product was not going to work. I did not think it was what would work in the city, and it was not going to be a positive. Um, so, as a resident in the city, I did not think that was a good idea, and it would not translate into helping my own personal property value. I, I live in the woods and a neighboring community very close to that. Um, you know, townhomes, um, the city is changing a little bit. We're starting to see a different demographic. I was born and raised here. Um, townhomes, with the price point that John has mentioned in his newspaper articles in the 300s, is something that fits a myriad of the population that lives in the city, whether that is young professors and or graduates of William & Mary that are looking to stay in the city, be close to campus, be close to where they went to school, and be close to where they work. Um, and it might help us create some long-term residents instead of us losing some of the younger folks that we do see graduate from William & Mary and go elsewhere. Um, young professionals starting their careers and families. Um, there is townhome developments that were alluded that have been successful, and uh, I see that I seem to think that you know, another townhome community would work for that. Again, I'm speaking as a resident of the city of Williamsburg. There have been many things that have been brought up about the architectural look on the exterior, how the stormwater is going to be addressed, and many of those concerns. I understand we're not here for that today, but um, I'm hoping that the developer will work with the community. Talk, listen to their concerns after today and talk about how we can make everybody happy and be one neighborhood. Um, I, I do understand that there's some, some questions given the history, and I think it is important to work with the neighbors, but as a resident of Williamsburg, I think a town and community such as this does appeal to the greater spectrum of people that live in the city. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come forward and speak? Okay, so seeing no one who's jumping up, then I will cl close the public hearing on this item and open it up to commissioners. Are there, from the comments, are there any questions um, or of Caroline or any other issues? We've got a lot of issues. I, I, there's a lot of issues here. I don't want to be the first one to speak. I'd rather someone um, else start. I have my own questions. I mean, yeah, we. Um, let's see. It the biggest one of the biggest problems is increased feeling that there be increased traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, city engineers and, and has um, said that can it handle even more. I don't see that as a, a huge problem. I, I drove through carriage homes several times. I didn't see another moving car at the time. But, you know, that doesn't mean it was what time of day I was there. Um, I think something that we really need to talk about with the developer is the stormwater pond. It seems to be a, sure. an issue, and perhaps discuss that. Um, so let me just try to organize us a little bit on this. I, I also had a question about the traffic study. So um, does anyone else have any issues of the traffic or the accidents? That's really what I was thinking that was is an issue for me is that the, and I don't know, <clears throat> Carolyn, maybe you, you could help us on this one, that the idea that the engineers are saying that you could have the throughput of the additional cars that's one analysis, but the um, documents that we got um, from a resident, and I 
have not. Well, I've read through all the art, um, all the memos mm -hmm. and all that. I have not memorized who wrote what. And so I, I'm sorry, I can't call someone's name out. Um, of that had the, um, the, the traffic accidents. Um, at first, when I saw that, I was just like, oh, well, that's really weird. It's going up, 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 and then we only have four this year. But it was from the first month only included. And so if you extrapolate that, we actually have an accidents at that intersection, which I think is a different measurement than the throughput of the, you know, the engineers. Mm -hmm. um, went from 24 one year to 33 to 38 to this extrapolation, 48. So it's just been going up and up and up and up. And I find that part of what's not really seen in the traffic analysis a little bit concerning. Do you have anything to sort of frame that issue, Carol? I don't have any additional information on that. Uh, what the uh, city engineer looks at is the amount of traffic that's by this development. And when there was a traffic study done when the, uh, the office complex and so forth was done and the amount of traffic that's generated from the office complex, which was acceptable for this intersection and for this development for the office complex, he looked at with the 38 units would be a, a lot less than what the office complex would generate during a day at that intersection and thought that the existing interchange as far as what's on the city side of that was was okay. So, yeah, so, those, so it's, for me, there's two different things that are going on there. There's obviously, to me, something that's happening traffic-wise that's creating accidents even if we don't have the throughput. But do the accidents involve entering and exiting? They're just at that intersection. Yes, that, so that's, we don't know if yeah, there's a I lot know. on the other side. I would also note that you, if you went in there recently, you note that some in, intersection improvements are being done in the James City County from the Brookwood Drive on the opposite side for a turn lane and they are shortening the uh, the island in the middle so that individuals can make that turn quicker and better also from w when you're coming from like uh, James City County from the school and from uh, the retirement community on the other side. So they're adding capacity to, for, for turn lanes there and they were also shorten that, that median in the middle back so that people can make that turn easier. Okay, so then the storm pond. Like their side of the street. Okay. Um, okay, so storm pond. Anyone else want to talk about the pond? I think we need to talk about what the pond is meant to do. One of it is one goal of any BMP pond is to reduce flow and prevent erosion of the downstream, which would disconnect that stream from its floodplain. The secondary use of a BMP pond is to trap silt. So you're actually expected to have to drill, uh, dredge it, excuse me, every so often to remove that silt and sand that build up. It's part of the maintenance of a BMP pond. That doesn't address, obviously, the issue of who's responsible for that maintenance. But if you enter into a community that has a BMP, you should expect that you will be contributing to the maintenance of that BMP at multiple levels to maintain its original engineering design. Has there, has there been any contribution from the property on the other side of 199 ever? No. Um, I think the <clears throat> concern about the architectural compatibility is Carolyn said, we're, we're not here to approve a uh, development, but the Architectural Review Board is the, the guidelines are very specific about what could be built there, what it will look like, and how it will fit in with the rest of the community. That's what they do. Um, uh, so that is my con that concern is, is something that that's the architectural view board. Yeah, I'll only add, I, I mean, I, I sympathize with the concerns um, about, about aesthetics, uh, but that is precisely what the architectural review board is designed to do, is to ensure that uh, this project will be compatible in terms of materials, in terms of scale, um, all these kinds of questions that, that have been coming up. That's not what this body is designed to do. That's the architectural review board. And so until there's a project to review that simply isn't it's not, it's not relevant.
for this for this body to consider. There's absolutely we have no we have no mechanism even for reviewing aesthetics uh, on the do for site commission. plan. Right. Yes, that's right. And so that's the other point at which the community might weigh in on considerations of things like garages and and where garbage cans are, uh, sidewalks came up. That's that's uh, the 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 piece of this process that would engage with questions about site plan. But again, not for us to consider here today. There isn't a project for us to consider. I, uh, again, my, I would like to address the very same thing. I'm a resident of Holly Hills myself, in fact, uh, so much that I'm in the picture. I'm that close <laughs> uh, on the picture that's up there. And, and I share a lot of the concerns in terms of the architecture and what goes on. I do believe a well-designed and well-executed townhouse community would be an asset, but unfortunately that's not our purveyance in here. That's not what we can do. What we can do is consider the zoning um, and not that, but I, I do take it very seriously because I do have skin in the game, so to speak. On the zoning aspect, one of the arguments is that this was zoned into RM1 with the comp plan, and RM1 has certain characteristics of up to eight, um, and thus we should accept, accept this as having that um, quality. And I guess I would like to know, and again, this is Carolyn, um, you know, what else is in the RM1? And I guess part of the idea that I have there is that we don't have spot zoning. So every single spot in the city does not have a unique R whatever district. But we categorize things into zoning categories, into groups. And so it isn't that the idea is that everyone in that group would be exactly at eight or seven or five or whatever, but that they have these common characteristics. And so that can be a zoning that is applied, you know, to different places across the city. So, you know, when we went, first saw this, it was RM1, great, but it had this zoning that was at the six range or five range, or whatever it is, um, that allows it to be the 20 total, that the idea that it has a right to eight, it just because it's in this category, I think that's part of the discussion of the previous time. So what else is in RM1? What else would we see in this category? Well, you've got the duplexes. I think I mentioned you've got the townhomes and each site. I mean, look, what development could we have to wrap our heads around this that is an RM1 site? Well, you've the got the carriage homes. So the carriage homes, right. Right next door. Right. Uh, their density just happens to be a little bit less based on the layout of the development. You've got uh, properties on Merrimack Trail that are zoned multifamily. You've got multifamily on. Uh, uh, but I mean, we have several New categories of multifamily, and that's really mm -hmm. where I'm. They're, they don't all have exactly the same layout. Layouts or, the same. or densities. I mean, there's a some range can be apartments, some can be townhomes, some are condos, some are as the carriage homes or duplexes. So there's a variety of different types of units and a variety of different types of density in the RM1, right. depending on the layout. If it would help, I, I did some quick math while oh, we were cool. listening. And so this lot is 6.8 acres. And if we, we know from our memo that Holly Hills Carriage Homes is 5.3 units per acre, if you carry that out, that should allow for a similar density of, at this site to have 36 total units. And they're asking for 38. And I, so that's a, that's units per acre, right? Mm -hmm. So that if we're going with that as our unit, then presumably it should result in a similar density and appearance. But as we know, that you know the the homes, uh, the carriage homes are potentially a little bit larger, and you know, there are all these other considerations. But just at the basic math level, what they're asking actually doesn't seem that far from the what would be allowed if you know, ignoring this twenty units issue from. 08, it, what would be allowed similarly uh, at this site if you compare it to the carriage home? Sorry, that was poorly worded, but uh, I just think the, the basic idea stands. So I did. I, I also did some math, and I actually was getting to uh, 24, not 36 or 38. So I, I guess my I'm, iPad yeah, doesn't I math just, right. Let me. Uh, that's. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
I'm still getting 36. Okay. But uh, let me... I think not the entire uh, right. parcel. You can't count the entire oh, parcel. Oh, right, because right. it's there's not all developable. Right, there's sure. only, there's only about four acres that are developable. Okay, where I then got you're the probably 24. getting a 24 that way. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, I think that that argument, because I, since I did the math while people were talking, that the idea of uh, something that several residents brought up was the, you know, the, the community um, resonating, the development resonating with the community that's at, which is where I was like, well, what if it was built out at the same density? That would be 24 yeah, um, versus sense. the 38. Um, I think one thing I'll just contribute to this as a way of maybe starting to move us forward um, is this is a very instructive um, uh, salutary <laughs> project to be or, or proposal to be considering uh, just before we begin the comprehensive plan updates um, next week because it, one of the things that it illustrates is the danger of, uh, well, it seems to me anyway, based on the history, uh, one of the things that illustrates is the danger of uh, trying to accommodate the, the, the comprehensive plan to what might be a momentary need. And uh, I, I may misunderstand how the history unfolded here, but that is, that's what I'm hearing in the 1998 designation of it as an LB district instead of an RM district. Uh, we began with RM1 in 1991, um, but uh, in, in deference to the desires of a developer, uh, rezoned it and it became LB4 uh, in, that, in that 1998 comprehensive plan, where it remained, uh, but only to be rezoned again um, in the 2007-2008 com comprehensive plan, again, out of deference to, to a developer. And so uh, with, this, with this proffer of putting a cap on the project of 20, 20 units in order to uh, get that rezoning through. So I guess one of the things that I see here is that this has essentially been uh, a property that, that was initially designated for residential, for high density residential. Uh, that's been adjusted over the years. It strikes me that it's still suitable for high, densi high density residential. Um, and the circumstances, its geography, haven't really changed all that much. And so as we go through in the next round of comprehensive planning, uh, at least it makes me think um, about how careful, how careful we really need to be to ensure that our designations are ones that we feel are the right ones and are going to be durable uh, and, and not try to accommodate what seem like momentary needs to, to avoid, um, well, I'll leave it at that. No, I, I appreciate that. And the idea that it was RM1 in 91 and we're still looking at that as the category, I, I do really appreciate that. Um, but given that this whole other community was built since that time mm -hmm. and sort of... In RM1. Right. <laughs> right. No, I understood. Yes. I, I think, as, as Dr. Klee was pointing out, that um, that the comprehensive plan is the underlying framework for everything, and that the 20 units was, as you say, just sort of a, a, a temporary need to perhaps negotiate a solution to an impasse right. that, that existed then, but we still have the comprehensive plan that um, is, is, is the guide, not, not a temporary agreement that was made at one point. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, people might rely on that temporary agreement and ignore the fact that the, that the comprehensive plan is really the fundamental document that we have to go by. C could I address that? So Please. a proffer is a voluntary condition on the zoning. It becomes the zoning of the property. They are voluntarily provided by the property owner. They are not negotiated with the city per se. The property owner has to agree that they're going to attach that condition. It becomes the zoning of the property, which is why it's RM1 with conditions. But it was, it was offered by the it developer at the time. It was offered by the, the time, property owner at the time. At the time, at, during a time of conflict. So when I say negotiated, I mean, you, you know what I mean by that. Not that it's just a temporary, you know, I'm not saying it was just, you know, something that's temporary that can now be disregarded lightly, and, and none of us are doing that.
Okay. Um, is there more discussion, or does someone have a motion to put on the table? We obviously, we can always discuss whatever motion is put on the table. Um, uh, this is painful, uh, and it's painful because there's clearly a lot of emotion and a lot of um, maybe mistrust. I hear a lot of mistrust um, and uh, a lot of concern, a lot of fear. Uh, I think we've we've heard today. Uh, despite all that, I, I I feel like this is things haven't changed enough between, um, frankly, 1991 and and today. Uh, for me to see that that essentially leaving this at RM1, removing the proffer, it seems it seems like a reasonable thing, and and the concerns that so many of you have. Uh, can be addressed and will be addressed as part of the development process when this project, assuming this becomes a project, goes before the Architectural Review Board. Um, so I, I, again, I'm sympathetic. I'm sympathetic and I, and I hope that there's a way to kind of um, rebuild some trust here. I'm not sure how that happens. Well, that's, yeah, that's regrettable. That's regrettable. Uh, but nonetheless. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think we. Yeah. So I hope there's a way to rebuild that trust. I don't know if that's possible. I hope it is. I have to hope it is. That this, but we're not. We're not being presented with a project. This is independent. Our decision is independent of any particular developer. It is simply what this zoning ought to be based on where it is in the city. And uh, for me, at least, the removal of the proffer seems seems reasonable. Leaving this at RM1. And so, is there a motion on that? Uh, I guess there is. So I move uh, that we recommend to City Council uh, the um, application that uh, would remove the 20 dwelling unit proffer on this property, leaving it at RM1 conditional. And adds the $60,000. With the 60000 yes. So I think that just to make sure everything's clear, that what you're putting on the table is the staff recommendation with all of the additional amendments that are associated with it. Correct. Thank you. So I think we heard um, a motion and a second, right? I'll second it. Second? Okay. Is there any further discussion? Aye. Aye. No. Aye. 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 Okay, so that will now be on City Council's agenda next month. Um, so our next order of business is open forum, and I do have a speaker card. Um, Janet Kozadlek. Sorry, I did really bad on that. We might need to wait. Please give us a, if you, a minute or two to let people clear the room, and then we can... Uh, good uh, afternoon. My name is Janet Kosidlak. I live okay, at uh, Shane Dell. It's strong speaker It's over there us. at... Um, uh, it's off of Capitol Landing Road. It's Brandywine. And... I had no idea it was going to be such a busy meeting today. <laughs> um, and I have a whole page of com comments, and I'll make them very, very short as I was listening to everyone else speak about their uh, situations. I was looking at uh, what I'm concerned about is uh, the plat of land on Capitol Landing Road right across from the distillery. And it's... Um, plots around 904 and um, 908 and it'll be coming up for discussion next meeting and I'm going to be out of the city so I wanted my uh, comments to be addressed to you today. It's, it, and there's the green sign on the property and it's uh, listed it as SPR and number 18-007. It's a convenience store with pumps across from the, uh, the, the distillery. 
Now, uh, I know you're all familiar with all the planning documents. I don't have to go through all of them. But here are some of the different words that are coming up. One that talks about the North East Triangle as a culinary and art district uh, that keeps coming up, and that that area is a tourist and hospitality zone. And other things that come up in the documents uh, talk about the design of Capitol Landing Road as being um, designated as a or their sea, uh, streetscape should incorporate elements to uh, promote the use of pedestrian and bicycles uh, uh, use. So I, I thought, hmm, bicycle use on Capitol, uh, on Capitol Landing Road. Let me see what it's like bicycling on Merrimack Trail to Penniman Road. It was a very interesting experience. <laughs> Um, you have a lot of businesses there where cars are exiting and, um, and entering. And I'll tell you, dear uh, members of the committee and the commission, it was a very experience, interesting experience, very scary and very hazardous. Um, so, you know, I, I pl please be aware of that if you want to uh, increase bicycling and um, and, and, and walking. So uh, what I'm, you'll probably be hearing more about some uh, of this issue the next uh, meeting, but I wanted you to hear from me and that really that you would not uh, approve that uh, proposal for the pumps and a convenient uh, uh, store. So thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you. Thank you for having the patience to wait. Okay. Um, so we have no site plans sub and subdivisions this month, or there's no unfinished business. Is there any new business um, or other? OK, so we have our various information items in our online packets. Um, and while sort of out of order for me um, here, the, our next meeting, we have a special planning commission hearing next Wednesday to um, address two um, requests from Colonial Williamsburg Foundation to amend the zoning ordinance to allow outdoor special events, and then a second request associated with the same issue to have the special use permit to ha have the Summer Breeze concerts on the lawn of the DeWitt Wallace um, Museum. Then also, immediately following that, we will adjourn our hearing and move into the workroom to have our first comprehensive plan meeting over the introduction and the goals chapters, and then next month, we have already a public hearing scheduled for June 20th um, to amend the zoning ordinance that will cover the issue of short-term rentals of bedrooms to transient visitors. So we have um, sort of a full agenda over the next month. Carolyn, did you want to have any comments, though, about our comprehensive plan meeting next week? Yes. Your comprehensive plan packet and your special meeting packets will go out on Friday. I would encourage you to go on our website and look at our new website for the comp plan and we can talk about feedback on that. What we're looking to do is probably starting next month is introduce several questions to the public so that they could go in and answer the questions and help us with the, the meeting that month. So I look forward to getting started on it and kicking it off next week. And so getting the packets means that our iPad links will be updated and they'll be available that's, that way, right? That's correct. Okay, mm -hmm. great, cool. Um, is, is there anything else? Okay, well then I will adjourn our meeting.